welcome to the uh, second uh, webinar of organized by the ETC, Education and Training Committee. My name is uh, Giuseppe Palmisano. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sao Paulo. And today I have the pleasure, I'm co-chair with Justina of the ETC. And today I have the pleasure together with Ben Collins to, to host Oliver uh, for this uh, second ETC webinar of uh, 2024. So just a few slides before starting the, the webinar. So the Education and Training Committee is a committee under UPO, the Human Proteome Organization. And actually the main aim of this committee is to organize workshop courses, tutorials and webinars like this one that you will listen today. And we, we aim actually at joining all the UPO members and all the proteomics community in and learn about uh, cutting edge topics. So uh, just one slide, I would like to advertise UPO 2024 that will be in Dresden, uh, Germany. Um, and uh, please visit the website. There is a, a very nice scientific and social program. And by the way, the first day of the UPO 2024, the ETC will be responsible for organizing pre-Congress training courses that are courses dedicated also to different topics for, uh, for uh, young uh, researchers, students, and so on. So by saying that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will actually now pass to, to Ben. Ben, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot, Oliver. And Thanks, yeah. Giuseppe. Thank you. So I'm, uh, as Giuseppe said, I'm Ben Collins from Queen's University, uh, Belfast, and uh, welcome also from me to the second webinar in the current season of the, the Hupo ETC uh, series, where we're, we're aiming to take this deep dive on uh, technical, technical background of, of some of the technologies that, that many of us are interested in. And so today we're very honored to host Oliver Rather from uh, Brooker Daltonics in Bremen, where he's a research and development manager uh, he got his MSc in engineering from the Hamburg University of, of Technology. And over the past uh, nearly three decades, he and his colleagues have developed uh, orthogonal time of flight mass spectrometers. And importantly, since 2010, this includes the, the Tim's Toff uh, product line, leading to, to many scientific publications and patents. And um, relevantly for, for today's audience, actually, Oliver was also awarded the, um, the Hupo Science and Technology Award in, in 2020 um, for contributions on the on the Tim's uh, technology. So I think we're very lucky today to have with of us with us one of the, the the leading experts in the in the field. Um, and I can confirm actually that he's one of the really one of the experts because as a part of this DIA passive collaboration we 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 uh, participated in with several other labs. We I got to visit his his lab in Bremen once and he showed me actually one of the very early uh, prototypes of the Timstoff instrument standing in his lab, which was which was cool to see. Good. So um, I think we're aiming for roughly a, a forty-five minutes talk, and then we have some questions and answer after this. Um, Martin's, uh, sorry, Oliver's topic today is the past, actual, and, and future directions of trapped ion mobility, time of flight mass spectrometry. And with that, I would pass the ball to, to Oliver. Uh, Oliver, if you can try to share your screen again. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. So um, I will switch off my video and, and uh, uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Many thanks, Ben, for the introduction, and, and many thanks to the ETC for having me here. It's always a pleasure to present something at the HUPO. I had some opportunities in the past to do so at the conferences. Yeah, uh, my title of the presentation is here. I will, uh, I need to locate my, yeah. So this is the, the more detailed agenda for today. As Ben mentioned, it will take about uh, 45 minutes, uh, three uh, chapters, let's say. First, I, I will uh, go through, let's say, the, the Tim Stoff trapped ion mobility separation instrumentation and um, give a short overview of, of what had been uh, uh, released already. And, and so if you are a Tim's of user, you can, can maybe sort uh, where you are and what you can do with your system, especially from the 
from the different DRA techniques we have uh, over the time implemented on the TIM stuff and also uh, for the future instrumentation um, we are currently developing. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, for those of you who uh, can stay until the end of the meeting, I will explain the picture you see here on the right uh, towards the end of the presentation. So starting with the, with the TIMS MS, uh, I, I have in the whole presentation not much formulas or theory about mobility cross-section or so. There are many good presentations out there and, and, and uh, um, articles published. So I, I try to keep it as simple as possible um, and, and give you more the big picture, let's say, of, of what is possible and, and not diving into technical details. So this uh, first set of slides is maybe the most um, technical one. And, and what you see here is a cross section of the TIMS analyzer. So we have here the analyzer section. We have a capillary uh, where the ions from the source are introduced and we apply a repulsive electrical field. So here you see the electrical field strings and above the zero line means they are repulsive. So ions are stopped in the electrical field here and the gas is pushing the ions uh, uh, towards the exit of the TIMS analyzer. And if the electrical field strength and the gas uh, uh, force are, are in balance, then ions are trapped. That's where the name a trapped ion mobility analyzer comes from. And now there's a short anim animation. So when we accumulate ions, we, we let them introduce. And you should, should see now that the uh, um, Bigger ions are stored here and the smaller ions are stored. Ah, oh, sorry, I have to switch on the laser pointer. So now I can point it. So these are the, the bigger ions, the smaller ions, uh, they are located along the axis of the, the analyzer. And we can now uh, uh, modulate the electrical field in order to release ions in basically a very flexible manner. So um, for the illusion of, of the ions, we would now uh, turn down the electrical field, and then uh, in the mass analyzer, we see a peak, a mobility peak. Yeah. So this stands for a certain mobility, this peak, and after a time, we can release the second one, or we can uh, scan the, the, the electrical field strength down, and then we could, would get this, this mobility peaks of the species formerly stored. And as we in the TIMS of have, of course, also a time of flight analyzer, a quadrupole for, for filtering and a collision cell for fractioning. There are a lot of possibilities uh, what you can do. I, I, I will uh, go into this later. Uh, for now, that's enough. And, and I want to show you um, how it's all begun. So there had been an initial publication from Francisco Fernandez Lima uh, um, and co-workers in, in 2010, where the first um, Tim's mobilogram uh, was shown. And um, this period of time where we had this, this breadboard or first prototype and until we um, launched the first Timstoff product, we, we upgraded the, the Bruker Impact Qtof with Tim's analyzer. And there had been like five upgrade kits we provided to collaborators like Francesco, but, but many others. And in this period of time, it's like five years, um, we, um, developed already a lot of methods for the TIM stuff. And, and one is um, maybe the most prominent one for, for the proteomics community is this passive publication. Passive stands for parallel accumulation sequential fragmentation. And this is uh, published by Florian Meyer from Matthias Mann Group um, and, uh, in 2015. And this was really a yeah, proof of concept paper. So we, uh, this, this, what you see here is, is not that important. Here you see the, the mobilogram um, and it was very manually programmed. So we just could address, let's say, uh, how many are these, like, like uh, four different or five different precursors in a row, but only this because everything has been manually programmed. And, and this was just to envision that later, if everything is automated, having a precursor selection algorithm and things like that, that, that it might be possible to do uh, proteomics here. 
Here's one other example, also very early before the launch of the first Timstorf, that is from Christian Bleiholder Group, uh, from, from Funny Caroline Yu. And, and they, they got like two of these uh, first TIM cells and they did, did run the first uh, tandem TIMS experiments. Oh no, sorry, sorry, no, this is CIU analysis. The tandem TIMS comes two years later. So, so this, is, this is CIU analysis of, of ubiquitin and uh, Christian always did a very good job with his uh, uh, team to, to demonstrate that TIMS is very comparable to uh, drift tube eye mobility spectrometry. So really in these early days, uh, people had been very skeptical about this technique but uh, also from the theory, and if you understand the physics, it's, it's pretty much the same than a drift tube. Um, yeah, and then in, in 2016, we launched the first Timstoff, it's called Timstoff, and um, that has now a dual TIMS analyzer. So to enable this parallel accumulation approach, we, we have an accumulation region and analyzer region to scan out the ions, as I just mentioned. And uh, with this parallel accumulation, we, we just could double the duty cycle. Um, this instrument generated then mobilograms like this. And uh, going back to the 2010 mobilogram, so it's the same species tuning mixture. And, and you see we, in, in this five years of development, the mobility resolution has been improved. But you also see that you now here see the inverse mobility. So there's a calibration applied. And yeah, so that, that's the progress we made, let's say, in the background without having any, any system on the market. And that's maybe some of the take home messages of this webinar that the, from the idea to an instrument uh, being sellable, there's, there's uh, in, in this time a huge time. Uh, but yeah, you will see in the course of the webinar that it always takes a lot of stuff to be done before. Um, the final user can 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 use it, yeah. So uh, in this case, it, it's like five years the development took place. And with this first instrument, yeah, we could do a lot. So for example, this was was just a measurement of of isomers, tree sugars, and uh, and and you can see on this, the TIMS is very flexible. That's one of the advantages. You can can decide by the ramp speed, yeah, how fast you 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 um, lower the electrical field uh, strength, um, you can decide on the resolution. So here we demonstrated that, that really with a resolving power of 20 to 40, it's not possible to separate this, the tree sugars in, 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 in mobility. But if you scan uh, slower, then you, you see them separated. There are other uh, examples of isometric lipids. And um, yeah, what, what was most important is that we also provided a data analysis software, let's say a viewer on the data where you could see the, see the so-called heat maps, where you see the mobility, the mobilograms, and the, the map which shows mass versus mobility. I will show uh, uh, that later. And we decided for an open data format. And from my uh, perspective, this was really one of the most important decisions taken um, because um, the processing software, yeah, especially for proteomics, is, is really a huge effort to add this additional dimension of mobility in, into the existing algorithms. And many groups in the world, I think in the first year, uh, uh, more than 40 times um, our, uh, um, S or, or SQL or, or TIMS um, development kit, software development kit had been downloaded. So uh, there was a huge interest in, in, in the bioinformatics groups and that was, I think, part of the success that uh, we could launch a uh, solution for proteomics. And yeah, actually, the TIMSOF was kind of successful because it raises a lot of interest. But I remember on the launch event, most people I spoke with, and it had been like 30, found it interesting, but they would not purchase it because the fully automated software is missing. Yeah, So no algorithm to do DDA. Um, no post-processing, so it was, I would say, moderate successful without these, these tools. But uh, still, a year later, um, we could launch the TIMSTOF Pro um, that had an improved TIMS analyzer, so higher capacity namely, and we had the acquisition software to do DDA passive. 
So we, we had a precursor scheduling included and we could steer the, the uh, um, TIMS analyzer synchronously to the TOF and, and really, really uh, decide about several precursors per TIMS screen. So we had a very high MSMS uh, uh, data rate of above 100 Hertz. Uh, that time that was really uh, uh, new. And we had also um, some collaborators who, who made it for the launch that was at Hupo uh, 2017 in Dublin, uh, who made it to have a running post-processing software. So here, uh, uh, Peaks and, and Max Quant from, from Jürgen Cox um, had been the first uh, um, software tools uh, to analyze the terms of data. Yeah, and, and also then we could release the, the, the second um, passive paper, again, Florian Meyer and co-workers. And um, yeah, here we, we could really demonstrate like the protein IDs and, and which was pretty uh, amazing that time. I know that meanwhile we have higher uh, IDs on, on the same sample, but, but that was at least for us was, was groundbreaking uh, um, performance with this technique. And yeah, so, and, and here I read the note, it, it was about three years after the technical publication where we manually programmed it. So it took at least also three years to implement the acquisition and the processing. Yeah, and from this, I can go a bit faster through it. In 2018, we launched the um, DIA passive um, uh, method, acquisition method, and, and also a first, um, Processing software that was then at that time open source. So uh, Matthias Mann formed in, in collaboration with Rudy Abersold Lab and, and Hannes Röst uh, from University of Toronto. And, and Hannes and his team really could um, yeah, adapt their open source software at the uh, um, iron mobility dimension. I remember that Aniha did, did really a good job to, to implement all the new stuff in, in, to, into the open source. And so we could launch then at uh, Hupo 2018, uh, this, this DIA passive uh, workflow. I have here a picture of the EvoCEP one because that also came out in this year. And uh, together with the team of Olive Worm, we, we adapted the EvoCEP also to the Timstoff. So that was another hardware launch then let's say from, from, uh, for the Timstoff family. Yeah, um, and here and now I have the citation for the paper I mentioned already that Christian Bleiholder in the same year uh, had the first publication with the tandem teams. So he put together with, with the colleagues uh, from Brooker Research in Billerick, uh, he put together two teams in a row and could do CID in between. And there are a lot of papers out. If, if you look at, if you're interested, you can look at, at uh, Fanny Liu. Uh, um, she published, yeah, I, I would say five, six, seven papers about the tandem teams and, and what you can do with it. They have also now a second generation of tandem teams where they can do uh, UVPD in between. So it's, it's interesting, but maybe not that interested for the proteomics community. Therefore, I don't dive into that. Chronologically, a year later, we integrated the ion source, the MALDI source from the Bruker Ultraflex and Rapiflex into the TIMSTOF and offered the TIMSTOF then with, with a dual source. So we could do MALDI and electro spray, spray actually at the same time, yeah, simultaneously. There was not that much use for, for doing electro spray and MALDI at the same time, but you can, without any mechanical uh, change of parts, you can switch between MALDI and, and, and um, ESI and the performance of the TIMSTOF flex is the same, it had been always the same uh, then for the uh, electro spray version of the Tim stuff. So um, yeah, it was, was very successful from also for Bruker who is the major vendor of Maldi equipment. It was a very successful Maldi uh, 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 product from that moment. And yeah, I, I have here just one of the, of the first papers or the first paper that is from Jeff Spragans. Uh, from, from Vanderbilt University, Richard Caprioli Group, and they really provided the imaging software and, and programmed the software on their own. So Bruker could, at the launch, not show such, such images, but what you see here. Uh, um, so this is kind of interesting. This is uh, a, a lipid 
uh, isomeric lipids having exactly the same mass, but different mobilities. And you see how the, the, the tissue image changes. Yeah? So for example, the one lipid, isomeric lipid is located only here, whereas the other is more located here. And, and that is really a new capability uh, to the world of multi-imaging. So that was an important milestone. Um, and yeah, from that, then um, going a bit quicker through it, we have the TimSoft Pro 2. So Pro, by the way, stands for proteomics, and, and that has a new TIMS analyzer, and it has also new in, a new instrument controller, um, which is very important in, in the, in the, uh, for, the, for the workflows I will show in, in terms of DIA. So we, we could, could connect um, the, the quadrupole and the TIMS in, in one FPGA and, and run it really synchronously. That, that was important to, to further improve the duty cycle, but also to enable additional workflows. And also in the same year, we, we um, launched the MALDI-2 possibility that is post-ionization with a second UV laser, and, and which increases the, the sensitivity uh, for apolar compounds like vitamin D or uh, other special lipids. Um, um, yeah, with that, you can go on. I just want to build up this tree so that you see what, what the different flavors of Timstoff look like. Um, so the Timstoff SCP is like a third branch of Timstoff. It comes with a little bit different form factor, but it includes uh, an additional a differential pumping stage. So we kept uh, at the source, we could introduce more gas into the system, pump it away in a so-called single cell cartridge. So SCP stands for single cell proteomics and, and it it's increases the sensitivity of the TIMSOFT Pro 2 by a factor of two, which is huge if you want to go to really low sample amount. And yeah, and then finally 2020, so we are close to today. Um, we, we had a next generation TIMS analyzer uh, um, and uh, introduced it in both systems in the TIMS of Flex and also in, on the TIMS of, which is now called HT with that. It has a new digitizer. So both systems have a new digitizer, which increased dynamic range of the, of the detection system, both on the digitizer side, um, but also on the detector because we can now amplify more in the digitizer and less on the on the detector and that that releases let's say the load from from the from the detector and yeah for the multi there was an increase in, in spatial resolution from 20 micron to 5 micron which is uh, also of course important and also needs a high sensitivity system because the smaller the 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 pixel is you you acquire the um, yeah, the more ions you need out of it to get a, a clear picture, let's say. Yeah, and then finally last year, uh, we launched the TIMS of Ultra. It was a further development of the TIMS of SCP. So again, um, higher, higher sensitivity. And um, yeah, with this, uh, the TIMS of family as of today is complete. And uh, what I want to point out is that Bruca is always a pretty I think user-friendly upgrade uh, uh, um, policy. So in principle, you could, could upgrade a TIMSTOF from 2016 uh, uh, to, to uh, 2024. It's, this, it's here a couple of steps. And, and I think meanwhile, we discontinue uh, upgrade packages here in between. But if you, if you had this old system and always purchased, of course, the, the upgrades, and then you could have still a state-of-the-art instrument. And that is true for all branches. There are some restrictions here on, on the MALDI side. So the first Timstar Flex systems could not be upgraded to MALDI 2 because uh, the window for the second laser was missing. So uh, there are some technical uh, boundary conditions where you could not upgrade, but we always have the policy. And, and I appreciate that our management agrees to it that we could, could upgrade customer systems because at least for me as, as developer, it's leading to a better collaboration and, and interaction with the, with the users. Yeah, that's, that's the, the first part, just giving an overview. And now I will start again with an overview uh, uh, for DIA passive or generally uh, data independent acquisition. And, and uh, we'll explain you 
um, some new developments which are uh, close to be released uh, for the for the DIA on, on the Tim stuff. So uh, first of all, I want to point out to this publication, it's from 2020, a, a group of Chinese authors around the Westlake University in Hangzhou, and, and they really assembled um, all the publications around DIA and separated them in, in uh, DIA acquisition uh, um, publications software tools and analysis tools. And um, I have to update this a little bit because uh, in the past three to four years, um, the, it's happening a lot, let's say in DIA. I, I would say DIA has, has, become, has become more like a standard for, for proteomics analysis uh, compared to DDA. And um, yeah, looking at this, um, First of all, I added here like five uh, yellow dots. Like yellow means it's, uh, uh, the software is supporting the broker Timstof Pro. Yeah, it says here in the publication Timstof Pro. And, and you see that meanwhile, all major software tools, especially Diane, Skyline, and, and also DIA Empire, Peaks, I, I mentioned already, it's, has been from the beginning, all uh, the software tools, um, let's say third party, software tools which are not related to, to a certain vendor. Yeah, then of course, uh, Bruker Timsaw is not supported, but um, yeah, this, this is uh, really well accepted, let's say in the post-processing developer community. And uh, I add another two systems, uh, uh, software tools. One is MaxDIA from Jürgen Cox Group, um, uh, published in 2021. And then I want to, to add the Bruker vendor specific tool, it's based on, on, on uh, uh, Diane uh, and, and it's also yeah, available of course with the Tim stuff. And on the acquisition scheme side, I also want to add one publication, especially because it's adding uh, uh, here uh, on the very top. And, and that is, a, I think, a very remarkable pa uh, paper from Shiroki Haugland Heiser uh, from, from David Klemmer lab. And, and she did already 2000, so uh, three years before the, the first, uh, um, or let's say then the second uh, uh, DIA publication came out, she already uh, um, demonstrated um, parallel analysis of, in this case, I think it's five peptides. So it's a five peptide mixture, and you can read out here the fragments of each peptide um, in, in these lines. And this line here is the mobility, and this line is the mass. So you, uh, it, it, I added it for the reason that this is exactly how the Tim stuff is operated today. Yeah. So this is uh, what we would now call a heat map, and here it's the drift time and flight time, but but it's basically mass and and mobility what you see here. Yeah. Um, maybe some remarks to to the other um, milestone. Um, Presentations here, so shotgun CID is, is, is really one which is very important, and, and it's from from uh, um, Pervine and, and David Gottlet lab. The DIA from Venable is so so he's from John Jade's uh, lab. It's a Scripps Research Institute, and um, yeah, this is a publication from from Matthias Mann Group. SWAS is maybe the most prominent DIA or most known a DIA. A DIA uh, um, method uh, developed at the ETH Zürich from um, Rudi Abersold group. And yeah, so Sona is, is from Waters and so on. It's on scanning source, a small uh, SciX now. And here we have the, the Bruker publication I just mentioned, the DIA passive. But what I want to do is I, I want to sort these, these um, different acquisition techniques a little bit. And I marked them uh, by color here for you. And uh, first of all, I mark all um, publication which do full mass DIA, I call it, so that which have no quadrupole isolation. They just apply collision energy. So at Ruger, we call it broadband CID. So you just switch uh, um, collision energy on and off and then try to analyze the data in the post-processing. So these are these three publications which, which are doing this. And then the majority of, of publications are about um, what I call selected mass DIA, 
like the swaths where you use the quadrupole to increase the selectivity. So you step through or scan through a quadrupole window and get higher specificity, a higher selectivity, and therefore can, can analyze uh, more complex samples. And these two basic or fundamental differences can be expanded and could be, let's say, complemented by eye mobility. And so I have two new colors here. And if you look, this very early paper I just mentioned, and the waters HDMSE, they make use of mobility separation, but without quadrupole usage. And uh, really at that time, and I think it's still the case, uh, uh, the Bruker had been the first uh, group and together with Matthias Mann, who, who combined both the mobility separation and selected mass. And that is, uh, as far as I know, still really a differentiator of the DIA on, on the Tim store. Yeah, so this quick summary, why to add the, the, the mobility separation to DIA, it increases selectivity, um, it reduces the FDR when you make use of the collision cross-section information. So for each species you, you detect in, in, the, in the DIA data set, you automatically also get a mobility or collision cross-section information. And uh, at the beginning, um, also in Matthias Mann group, there was a publication, they just uh, um, built up a library where I think it was more than 100,000, maybe even more than a million. I think the goal for Matthias was to, to really have a million of peptides in a database with collision cross-section. So like a spectral library, including collision cross-section or, or uh, uh, mobility. Um, but meanwhile, I think that is no longer used because the, the tools like Diane with the neural network training, they can predict the mobility pretty good. Yeah, they, they predict actually also the, the spectral library. That means spectral library means you have different intensities on the fragment. And that is important for, for library matching in, in DIA that, that you know the probability or the intensity ratios of the, of the peptide fragments. And, and that is really one of the major differences uh, today, I, I think they, they call it direct DIA. I, I don't know the, the term, but, but Diane, I think, was first to introduce it, this direct DIA, and, and uh, Spectronaut has it, and, and I think many other tools will also have it, that you now uh, use a neural, neural network approach and, and a huge uh, training data set, and then you can uh, just by the sequence of the library um, peptides, you can, can in silico predict the, the spectra. And that uh, means that you these days no longer need to do um, a DDA with maybe LC fractioning, so huge effort experiment to create your library. So that, that's really uh, also a game changer, let's say, on the DIA uh, acquisition. Yeah, and um, with the with the DIA passive, which I will explain in the next slide, we also increase the duty cycle compared to the, to the uh, selected mass DIA. And then I will explain how this works. Um, so in the rest of the webinar here, I will use this heat map only. This is just more a symbol, let's say. Uh, you see the mobility on the y-axis, the mass um, on the x-axis, and Typically, these are the doubly charged, triply charged, and, and highly charged peptides. And this is singly charged species. Also contain, of course, a lot of peptides. But normally, we target here this region um, for proteomics. And um, here in the webinar, I simplify the TIMS operation. So the red line is now a symbol, let's say, for the electrical field strengths I mentioned. And um, yeah, what, what uh, we do is we scan the, the electrical field strength and then we elude, let's say, row, row by row uh, uh, the peptides and, and uh, um, they undergo, let's say, collisional uh, fragmentation, CID, collisional dissociation in, in the collision cell or selection by the quadrupole. So the TIM scan uh, um, is now just depicted like this. So we have a starting point and we have an end point for the TIM scan for the electric field strengths we scan. And a typical scan 
the uh, time is like 100 milliseconds. It's, it's very flexible, as I mentioned, but, but just here to, to make it a little bit more um, practical, I, I put in this, this, this timing here as an example. And if you now want to do um, DIA on, on the Tim stuff, um, I overlay here a region, light blue is now, this is by the way from the, uh, from the control software of the Tim stuff, um, the editor where you can select the region you want to address. And in this case, um, if you want to address this, this regions, um, then this is the, the um, DA passive uh, works like this. So you use this, the quadrupole to select a mass range. So a mass range or the 25 Dalton mass window is depicted here in green. And you see the red um, scan range of the TIMS. And if we now start the TIMS scan in slow motion, yeah, we address the peptides on this red line. And um, once we reach this point here where the blue program area ends, the quadruple jumps to here and scans the next and the next, yeah? And then we can, so this is now 100 milliseconds and then we can continue with the next 100 milliseconds addressing the next part of the error and so on, yeah? So I think the animation speeds up now, yeah? So, um, in total, it takes us um, 800 milliseconds to go through all of these, these regions. That is a typical method on the Tim stuff. And, but that means it's compared to the selected mass DIA without mobility separation, it's three times faster because we jump, as you remember, we jump two times and in 100 milliseconds, we address already three 25 Dalton uh, uh, mass windows. So we have, have higher duty cycle and we have the additional benefit of the selectivity I, I explained with the predicted mobility. So this is um, uh, the technique we introduced it first. And uh, meanwhile, there are a lot of groups working with this and I want to highlight some of the publications coming out with this technique. Uh, first one is um, a pretty recent uh, publication uh, from Patricia Skrovonek from, from the Matthias Mann group. And, and she uh, and her co-workers had, had uh, provided a, a Python tool which, which uh, defines the window size, so the window width based on the density. You here on this figure from this paper, you see the density of the, I guess it's Gila species here. And, and the, the window size is broad here at the beginning where, where, where they are low. Uh, um, or a smaller number of peptides in this region. And then the window size shrinks down here to the middle and then it becomes broader again. This gives you an additional duty cycle approach. Then I have a presentation here from Vadim Demetchev lab, uh, Lukas Cheville. Um, this is also most recent publication on BioArchive 2022. They called it slice passive. The good thing is if um, Vadim is involved here. You always get also a Diane version, uh, which can handle the data acquired and is, is kind of optimized. And I have a couple of other uh, examples here. This is from Nikolai Slavov lab, uh, Jason Dirks, and, and he, is, he is doing kind of interesting uh, uh, technique doing uh, multiplexing on DIA. So they, they use like three plex um, Amtrak uh, reagents here. And um, yeah, that, that is also a new approach. And again, I think Vadim is here yeah, on the list of authors. So you get directly an adapted Diane version, which can retrieve the, or make use of the, of the correlation of the different detect peptides. Yeah? And, and that is of course a benefit. Yeah, another publication, Speedy Passive uh, from, from Markus Walder Group, again with, with Vadim here on the list of authors. And, and also Lucas. And yeah, with this, I, I want to switch gears and show you uh, something uh, new. And uh, at Brooker, we, we programmed already the acquisition scheme or had programmed it uh, since 2020. 2020. And um, maybe you have not heard about it right now because it's not yet, let's say, usable for the for the end user, so for, 
for, for the proteomics community. Um, what, we, what we change is that we go from this uh, um, acquisition scheme to um, that one. Yeah? So we can now scan parallelograms and program parallelograms. We can, could even program trapezes, um, but, but currently we are using uh, the parallelogram because the calibration is for the moment only uh, provided for this kind of scanning. And if we want to address such an area here of the heat map, then we again um, add the quadruple isolation window, um, but we, we don't scan now in this direction and have the jump, but we move the quadruple window together um, with, the, with the TIM scan. So that looks like this. And as you can see, we now address, let's say, the peptides on this red bar. And because it's like diagonal in the, in the heat map, I named it here, and, and I think we tend to name it uh, diagonal DIA. And yeah, if, if it continues, the quadruple jumps back, and then the TIM scan, second TIM, TIM scan is gone, gone, and so on. So we address the blue area. And if you, if you have noticed, the area of peptide content is actually namely the same than on the, the former DIA scheme where the quadruple jumps, but we address the same area with less TIM scans. So in this case, we just have, in this example, let's say, we just have uh, um, six MS, MS TIM scans. I always add a, a survey scan in MS. So we, we reduce this, this cycle time to 700 milliseconds from, um, from 900 to 700, which is again a plus of 30% in duty cycle. And, and it's, it's like now four times faster than the selected mass DIA alone. And yeah, with this additional duty cycle, you could, for example, reduce, if you, if you, you, you can make the chromatography faster or you reduce the window size to increase selectivity. It's, it's all very flexible. And yeah, as I mentioned, since 2020, um, some collaborators in the bioinformatics uh, community uh, um, work on processing tools, making use of it. And um, one very prominent collaborator is, is Stefan Tenzer and his group uh, from the um, University Clinicum in Mainz. And, and he is proposing, a, 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 I would say it's even an additional dimension. Uh, so what, what Stefan Tenzer recognizes or, or Envisions. He, he actually he, he he filed a patent already in, in in 2020. So right before we we provided this this new acquisition scheme, and and he is suggesting that you can do on each. And I focus now on, on this chart of this figure. Um, each fragment, yeah, in the DIA has a certain pattern, yeah, like this this diagonal uh, um, pattern. And this pattern is highly related to the precursor. That is because the precursor is, is scanned uh, by the quadrupole. And the scanning quadrupole is like, say, I, I want to make it here really, yeah, really easy, the explanation. So the scanning quadrupole is introducing a pattern which is related to the precursor. So, and if you see such fragments, which uh, based by an AI algorithm and, and also again machine learning could be correlated to each other. So you see a high, high intense fragment and a very low intense sparse uh, 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 um, fragment. And you could calculate back to the precursor, um, to the precursor mass, to the precursor mass. And that is within the range of plus minus two, plus minus one Dalton. That means we have a selectivity on this experiment like in, DD, in, in DDA, yeah? we, we have a one Dalton mass isolation window just calculated out of this uh, uh, diagonal DIA scan. And, and that is really, yeah, I, I would say it's adding a dimension, it's adding the precursor uh, correlation dimension, even if it's mathematically not a dimension. And, and with this, uh, uh, Stefan Tenzer can directly uh, uh, retrieve DDA-like spectra out of the data set, of the, out of the D DIA data set. So really, uh, you don't no, no longer need to, to have a, a spectral library. You don't need any library. You can do all the applications where, where de novo sequencing is required. And that works pretty good in, in this um, 
bioarchive publication, Stefan demonstrated that the, that the spectra quality is, is much better than on a comparable DDA run. Yeah, so really this will open um, DIA to, to, let's say, a, a, a additional set of, of um, applications. So that is, is, is coming. It's not yet uh, published the software and actually Bruker is working to, to introduce this technique maximum information DRA or media passive into the um, proteoscape software. There's another uh, uh, very interesting publication named Synchro Passive, again from Patricia and, and, and Matthias Mann group. And, and she is using the same technique, so the diagonal um, uh, DIA. And, and she is, I, I, I put in this picture, this figure here, because it's, it's very interesting. So this is like DDA, acquisition scheme, you have to make use only on, on small spots, uh, make use of the, of the uh, peptides with the, um, yeah, she, she's calling it here, current DIA. Um, there you have the, the scanning TIMS and, and this, the, the quadrupole selection and then jumping here, you see this is the peptide content. And if you scan along this diagonal, you see it's, it's much more peptide content. And this bars here show actually uh, the difference, yeah, it's three times higher uh, fragment contact in this this uh, this synchro scan. Also, Patricia is is introducing and uh, and her group, I think from the informatics is namely uh, uh, Sander Willems and and Georg Ballmann. Um, they also uh, uh, using kind of precursor correlation, so they can uh, um, uh, filter, let's say, the the resulting fragments. Uh, and, and increase the probability uh, uh, for the library matching. It's still, I would say, more a classical library matching approach that will not generate um, DDA-like spectra, but also very interesting uh, thing. And um, yeah, here I want to really encourage you to look for upcoming um, publications or releases um, for Alpha DIA, that is the tool uh, Matthias Mann group is developing for Spectronaut, so, so Biognosis is also working on a, on a uh, updated Spectronaut version, uh, which can make use of the, the diagonal DIA and, and it shows already a prototype, showed sort of very promising data um, with faster cycle times and, and increased uh, ID. Um, that will be for sure released around ASMS. So I think it's it's a good practice of, of uh, biognosis to release Spectronaut um, just in front of ASMS. And that is a plan here to then also provide a tool for this um, diagonal DA and see yeah, the Bruker Proteoscape. I, the release date is, is not clear yet, but it's also, I think, to come in the next couple of months. So. With that, I end the part of the um, DIA. And uh, yeah, now we go to the future of um, uh, yeah, uh, and, and current R&D work at Bruker. And yeah, I, I uh, have named here this. This is, this is how, how AI, like OpenAI ChatGBT, uh, would illustrate the Tim's stuff. And then I tried uh, another illustration of a future Tim stuff that looks like this. I think the AI is not yet there, but those of you who have maybe seen recently um, the, 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 the announcement of OpenAI Sora, which can generate um, videos out of, of text input, that's really kind of uh, yeah, fascinating and, and terrifying at the same time, but, but maybe the future of, of Mass spectrometry development will also go in that direction. Who knows? At the moment, I cannot imagine. You see, it's more like funny than, than real uh, suggestions here. But anyway, um, what is, is uh, coming from, from uh, yeah, the Bruker hardware groups? And I, I just want to acknowledge that we have, meanwhile, um, hardware development. Oh, we all had all the time uh, um, also in Bellerica where Mel Park is heading the R&D group in, 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 so in close to Boston. We have the site in, in Philanten now, and we have a pretty new site in Essence. So um, we also globalize kind of the, 
the R&D work. And, and one very interesting uh, uh, approach I, I will show you now. Um, actually, as it goes back to a patent also from, from Mel Park, Mark Richway, and, and Desmond Kaplan from 2011. So the idea doing this is not that new, but, but meanwhile, we have first prototypes running and, and it it's really looks, looks promising in, in my uh, uh, point of view. And um, this is a, the heat map I've shown shown with this let's like symbolic TIM scan in 100 milliseconds. And this time we operate it differently. We just would apply electrical field by year. So a pseudo potential, uh, um, no, not a pseudo potential and, and electrical field strength. And if we would do it at a certain voltage, then, or, uh, um, then what would happen? The low mobility species, which are here in the upper region of the heat map, they will pass the TIMS analyzer and the higher mobility species are trapped. So we have a first uh, um, TIMS mobility low pass. So low mobility species, higher mass species uh, will, will uh, be passed. And here at this position, let's say, we could add a second uh, TIMS mobility low pass with a slightly different voltage. And doing this, um, again, the, the low mobility species will pass and in this case will be discarded. Um, and, and what will happen is that we trap here a gas phase fractioning. So we, what we have designed here is kind of a, a gas phase selection. And um, with this, we could, for example, pass it to, to a third uh, um, TIMS stage and, and do uh, mobility scan here, for example, yeah? But this is not the envisioned use case. I will show you now based on this principle. So I will call this now, these first two um, TIMS mobility low passes, I will call TIMS mobility filter and the third TIMS cell, I, I will call the TIMS mobility analyzer, yeah? Having this definition, I can show you some, some new workflows we want to implement. And so we have now the filter here, Remember, we can select a fraction of species out of the heat map and we have the analyzer here. And, and what we uh, uh, propose to do is then doing DIA passive with fractioning. In this case, we would discard the species here and then transfer um, once one selection uh, or one fraction. And then we would apply the standard diagonal DIA TIM scan, so quadrupole isolation, and we would scan here. And if the quadrupole reaches that position, we would step-by-step step pass the, the other fraction seamlessly. So the TIM scan will remain the same. So the good thing is data processing will also remain the same. So in this case, we have the processing software right away. And we have another capability here, and that is parallel accumulation. If you remember my picture of the TIMS filter built out of two TIMS cells, um, the, the, the second one acts as an accumulator. Yeah? So we accumulate always in second and we, we, um, yeah, we, we, we scan in the third and, and this works like this then. Um, so we do accumulation here, transfer, scan and accumulate the next segment, accumulate the next segment. And once we are at the end of the first diagonal scan, we have accumulated already the first fraction. So that means we can seamlessly accumulate in parallel to the sequential fragmentation, which then gives us again high duty cycle. And yeah, I think I just repeat the animation here to, to see the accumulation on the left and the scanning on the right. And um, yeah, so what are the benefits of this mode? So what we could do is we could convert the high sensitivity of the Timstoff Ultra yeah, to, to higher dynamic range and, and deeper proteome coverage. Yeah, so from the Timstoff Ultra, we can make use of this technique already for sample amounts above 20 nanogram. Yeah, on, on 20 nanogram or lower, so the single cell application, uh, it would not make sense to, to apply this technique. But if you apply like, like a microgram, of sample, if you have enough sample amount, then you can make use of this, this technique and you just, uh, in the best case, you automatically adapt the, the size of each fraction 
um, to the sample amount. Yeah, in like a um, not an automated gain control, but like in a, an iron charge control uh, um, real, realized by this fractioning in, in the first TIMS filter. So this is something uh, promising. Uh, we will do some proof of concept me measurements had already been done, but we don't have yet the acquisition software to run everything uh, um, over an LC run. So we only can do uh, proof of concept ex experiments at the moment. But uh, another very promising operation of this TIMS filter is what I called here PRM. And, and PRM passive is already uh, possible with the TIMS stuff, but we would um, add a special mode for low abundant species. So for example, if you're in a targeted approach, know that here is a peptide of one protein of interest with very low abundance, which we not can quantify on a standard PRM experiment, then what we could do is that we discard the, the upper and the lower uh, region and actually operating the, the TIMS filter with static voltages, what, what I've shown, we increase the, uh, the mobility resolution of the TIMS. Yeah? Scanning very slowly increases the mobility resolution compared to, to fast TIMS scan and having it at static condition gives you highest mobility. So at least 200 mobility resolution should be possible, maybe even higher. So uh, Francesco Fernandez Lima showed, showed uh, resolutions up to 450 on, on, a, on a modified uh, uh, TIMS analyzer. But yeah, we, we are not yet there to, to spec this, but we could have this narrow isolation and then uh, um, we would accumulate, yeah? We accumulate just this fraction and we can accumulate over pretty long time. So for the TIMS of Ultra on, for example, Plasma, we, we, we run with five milliseconds accumulation time. And uh, here you could, could run with like 100 milliseconds, which is still fast, but you would have a, a factor of 20 increase in sensitivity and, and protein death coverage for selected targets. And yeah, if we, if we have this, this species now accumulated, we can apply the quadruple filter. And as it is targeted, we can select the window size. We could go down to one Thompson if necessary. If we want to have the isotopic uh, uh, pattern, then we, we make it a little bit broader. But this really, uh, um, I at least, uh, um, I'm pretty sure that this will, will give very good um, PRM performance. Uh, on, on this TIM stuff. And um, yeah, you see, uh, we will increase the mobility resolution at least by a factor of four. So higher selectivity, we can combine it with a narrow quadrupole window and we could even combine such PRM uh, um, targets with DIA, diagonal DIA. But I think a, a general PRM approach where we typically run like 80 targets um, in a classical, let's say, PRM, where we address a lot of uh, uh, targets in a standard TIM scan. And uh, uh, then we could add like three high sensitivity PRM and targets with making use of the mobility fil TIMS mobility filter. And this will, will give us one second cycle time. So let's say 83 uh, um, PM targets plus uh, uh, an MS per second. That should be easily possible. And of course, you can have it flexible for medium uh, um, abundant peptides. You can, can reduce it and then address more. And, and so it's, it's, it will be flexible, that's for sure, especially on PRM with all the possibilities. And finally, I want to, to show you a last um, usage or a third usage of the uh, TIMS mobility filter. And that is, um, that is uh, uh, excluding high abundant species like the, the high intense albumin peptides from neat plasma. And what we would do is we, we do a survey scan, so the MS scan, and have a detection of the high mobility, uh, of the high abundant species, and we would dynamically filter them out. So in this case, yeah, it works like this. You can imagine we, we scan uh, in diagonal DIA, uh, the first fraction of the heat map, then we yeah, stop here, let's say, and then we could decide now the, the um, high intense precursor is eluting. We could either 
skip it, so jump uh, above this mobility rate region, or we scan it, but with a very short accumulation time. So the filter has normal accumulation time here in this region, like five milliseconds, and then we have even lower or no accumulation time on the high abundance species. Here it's still uh, in the heat map. And then we scan with another short accumulation time the rest of the, of the heat map. And yeah, with this, um, we have, yeah, first time in my presentation now at the end, we have a slight disadvantage in Tuesday cycle because we need two accumulation times. So if we, if we have one precursor, uh, which we want to deselect, yeah, filter out, then we need to, to um, accumulate two times. And, and if we want to exclude, like in this example, five, uh, four precursors, we need to accumulate five times, depending on the distribution of the precursors. So we can do parallel accumulation, but if they are distributed not evenly spaced, then we will lose, in worst case, uh, for each excluded precursor, the ACU time. And, and yeah, doing uh, um, some math here for, if, for this example, if you want to exclude uh, um, four targets, we lose about 80% of duty cycle, which is still great. Um, and uh, further than that, uh, Aaron Pancek from, from our research group in Bellarica, together with Ben Jones and, and Mark Ridgeway, they have, have already shown that, that they see a, a huge increase in identified proteins out of neat plasma with this technique. Um, yeah, and with this, I'm at the end of my presentation, hopefully kind of in time, and yeah, I exceeded a little bit, and I would end with the acknowledgement, and I'm happy to answer questions. Fantastic. <clears throat> So thanks very much, Oliver, for this this very deep dive on the on the technical aspects of um, of Tim's. We do have a few questions. Um, I can I don't know if you can see the Q and A, or I can try to summarize for you. Uh, so the first one concerns um, the MyDA passive. Uh, whether so, you mentioned Proteoscape software. Do you think there will be other software solutions available, in particular open source software solutions like Skyline? Are there any activities on this side planned? Yeah, or? Actually, I, I, I do not know about Skyline. I, I hope that, that the Vadim Dimitrov group is, is also working on, on uh, a processing software, mm -hmm. um, maybe also for the, for the media. I mentioned that that, that is a patent of the uh, University of Mines. Um, so I think that has to be negotiated with Stefan Tenzer or, or the, the university to get a license. I, I'm not 100% sure how, how this happens, but I really hope that so the, the, the diagonal DIA I, I showed is, is already since ASMS last year included in the acquisition software. It's called VistaScan there. And I think that, that users will acquire data and, and all the bioinformatics groups can, can acquire data if they have access to a Timstoff or a collaborator. So mm -hmm. I hope that, that this uh, will take place and, and that all other tools and, and vendors of, of processing software will jump on this. Maybe they need to be convinced by, by, by the protein <laughs> performance in the end, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. So, and then the second question is also about the, the sort of diagonal uh, schemes, whether does Oliver think that, that um, these should have utility in small molecule applications, kind of similar to, to PASF, which was originally, I guess, developed for pepti peptides, but then uh, implemented for lipids and so on. Do you, do you see su yeah. such thing happening for the diagonal schemes? Yeah, definitely. So I, I knew that our applications group, um, found already its advantage to use it for lipidomics. Um, and uh, especially the, the media, um, or my DIA, how you termed it, um, that is, that is uh, uh, capable to do uh, um, yeah, spectra, DDA spectra retrieval without spectral library. So you can do any, any uh, uh, application with that and still get DDA-like spectra out of a DIA run. So that, that should work. Not sure if the software supports it. So really, the software is uh, maybe you have recognized that 
Stefan Tenser and Brooker started 2020 to, to implement it. And it's maybe now close for, for release, but it, it's high effort, I would say. And it is the group of developers is not small there. Yeah, yeah. The, the next question is also about small molecules and especially less than 150 m over z. Is there um, any development that might improve uh, analysis for these small molecules using TIMS, like the small, small? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, we are working on improvements here, but it's too early to, to give any concrete statement. We, we know about this and, and that you actually lose duty cycles. So we have this, we, I think we call it TIMS stepping, where you have a very small molecule scan and then another scan on, on higher masses. Um, but then you lose 50% of the duty cycle and, and uh, for most applications. I think for small molecules, it's used from time to time. But yeah, we, we know about this. And, and yeah, I, but I cannot announce any concrete result or, or development here. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, fourth question is relates to um, library matching uh from dda to dia analysis how important is it to have the same lc conditions um is there some flexibility there yeah um i'm not expert on this maybe rather you ben but <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say i would say the 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 dda generation of a library is no longer that important so the 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 um Colleagues from, from Biognosis, they mention that you maybe get two, a, a low single digit percentage increase if you take the effort and, and generate on the same system with the same LC, a DDA library. Um, but the predicted library, um, or I think, I think it's called direct DIA, at least in one tool, that mm -hmm. is, is, is most of the time used and, and for, for everyday work, especially if you run DIA across different instruments, uh, maybe even from different vendors, then the direct DIA approach is, is much more yeah. advanced and, and easier to, to integrate. I, I agree with this. I mean, I think you can still top up a little bit with these larger libraries. And in terms of the chromatography matching, um, mo many of the softwares have now nonlinear alignment in the retention time space. And I think this makes uh, a big difference if you want to match across LC conditions that are somewhat different. Although the further you get away, the less good it is, I would, I would put it like this. But I kind of agree, Oliver, that it's, it goes in the direction of um, direct analysis. OK, uh, do you think it's possible to create a type of spectral library for the 14 more abundant proteins using the dynamic mobility filter and he this person mm -hmm. even proposed the name digital depletion he wants to call it, david gomez varela <laughs> so I, I i actually maybe i do not get this fully so there are 14 abundant proteins and i guess he was talking about the plasma data uh, that you showed towards the end there yeah I, I i excluded four of them ah. um i i think identifying them is is not that much of an issue. Yeah, in, in they will be low abundant species on the tailing of the chromatography. So typically they tail a lot, and and I think we identify them all the time. Problem is that that uh, they suppress other ions, other low abundant species uh, with the same mass and mobility. And 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 here yeah. you really uh, um, the deselection uh, uh, work pretty well on on. Yeah. A few of the albumin peptides. That has, this is maybe kind of what I just mentioned at the beginning with, with Florian Meyer and, and colleagues did, did program it manually. That is the status now. Yeah. So so mm. really they programmed manu manually to to exclude the 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 high abundant albumin peptide species and and showed great progress. But now all the software acquisition software need to come together and 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 do it then in an automatic manner. Yeah. Okay, I, I, David, I don't know if we answered the question. You can write a clarification if you like, but I, I think I think maybe. And then, so the last one, people keep adding questions. So <laughs> I say the last one again. So with respect to the fractionation, how do you keep track of calibration in the IMS dimension? Does it become more challenging, requiring more evenly spaced calibration solutions that would show up in all fractions? So how do you calibrate with this fractionation in our yeah. mobility dimension? Yeah, maybe, maybe just just one command to the former question. I, I like the oh, yeah. digital depletion. Uh, <laughs> it's oh. a good name. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, so um, actually it's calibration is not affected for two of the three uh, um, things I propose. You have, if, if you have this third TIMS analyzer where you do the fractioning, let's say very systematically and transfer the, the, the fraction right in time for the analyzer scan, then you, you just keep the, the calibration of the TIMS analyzer. If, of course, we need a calibration of the TIMS filter. That is anyway needed, yeah? So the static calibration of the TIMS filter, that is, that is an additional calibration we have to, to implement. Um, that, that is possible, but it's not yet seamlessly implemented. One of the tasks we, we have to do, of course. Um, and for the, the same is for the um, PRM. Uh, approach I, I have shown there you just need to calibrate the filter and then you have the mobility of, of that special target species the classical or the, the higher abundant PRM targets will be run as normal and then we add some species I, I had had a nice conversation with Tejas one or the, I, I think the uh, um, uh, R&D manager of biognosis and he said it's not not any problem to to include those those targets in, into their PRM uh, uh, software uh, spectrum mine, so that that will be very easy. So I, I guess we get it right away when when uh, uh, when we have the acquisition scheme ready. And yeah, I guess that that will then also uh, um, be the case for the other bioinformatics platforms. So calibration there is, is I would say it's some work for the filter calibration, but it's it's not challenging or not risky or what yeah, it's it's it's, it's I, I think it's just work to be done mm -hmm. um, for the third mode there it might happen that calibration is more challenge, challenging because we we need the service scan uh, directly giving you the same abilities as as then the, the fractions and and stopping and starting the tim scan for example if we need to or, or jumping across um, what we did so far is that we calibrated both parts of the scan separately. And actually it's, it's one and the same calibration. If you have say, the same scan speed on the TIMS, then the calibration can easily be uh, uh, transferred. Only if you, you, you uh, change, let's say the slope of the speed, then you need as of today, recalibrate. Uh, Christian Bleiholder published an approach where you can have, how is he calling this papers about uh, unified calibration, yeah, and then he, he's, he, 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 with a set of experiments, he could calibrate the TIMS analyzer independent from the slope, and 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 so that that might be be some approach, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's definitely a, a question okay. which needs an answer. Okay, and just maybe one further question from me on that is because the hardware you need serial TIMS analyzer, I guess, to to make this work, as in. Are we likely to see new hardware coming to support this at some point, or what's your feeling about that? Yeah, so at least the, the TIMS filter would fit in the TIMSTOF Ultra or in the TIMSTOF SC. It, it would fit, fit in any TIMSTOF. Um, uh, so it could be an upgrade, well, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that could be an upgrade. I would say it make only sense for the TIMSTOF Ultra mm -hmm. uh, because you need the high sensitivity in order to to have the the short uh, uh, um, accumulation times. If you if you would do it on on let's say in terms of HD or, or older Tim stuff, then um, you would lose duty cycle by that, or, or less gain, let's say, in filtering. Um, so the PRM workflow definitely could be an upgrade. I, I don't know if that is decided to be an upgrade mm -hmm. or if a new product will be released. We have, of course, a lot of other components in development. So maybe we release a new product and, and combining a, a couple of components. Um, but yeah, in the past we always offered also an upgrade if, if possible. Um, for the for the other two scan modes, we need a third uh, TIMS analyzer, a third TIMS cell. Theoretically, it fits in in the ultra because we have this single cell cartridge. There we could integrate another TIMS, but that's not the best best performing uh, uh, design, I would say. So uh, possibly we will come come up with with uh, a new uh, um, design on, on, on this Tim's filter. Okay, great. Yeah, but okay. it's, it's nothing I can, can stay for granted. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, not yeah, sure. yet decided it's still in development. So. 
Good. Okay. Well, then I think we can we can start to finish up because it's it's getting a bit late. But then we we finish with maybe one controversial question, which you can answer or not. But some in the chat would asking questions about comparisons between Tim's Tough Ultra and, for example, Astral. And there's also a proposal to have a debate at ASMS between the you know, some kind of face off between these two. So, do you have any general comment about the um, comparison between these two type of instrument? Yeah, of course, we, we look closely what, what the uh, ID guys at, at the other side of the River Weser are doing. Uh, so they are also located here close by in Bremen. That's what I mean. And and yeah, it's it's a very interesting instrument, of course. And and I I, I would say it gives surprisingly from, from the publication I see and from, from uh, uh, users, um, it gives surprisingly good results. Actually, I, I see some... Uh, um, we have some compromises on that system, um, but as it performs good, I, 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 it's, it's, it's a good combination. And yeah, really, uh, I think for the community, it's good if, if there are uh, as many as possible different hardware configurations competing. And, and that, that is also for us a, a nice challenge to, to have. OK, good answer. <laughs> uh, I think we can we can wrap up there. So. Giuseppe, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I would like to to thank Oliver. Thanks, Oliver, for uh, actually this great overview on the history of Teams and also showing us all the different flavors of the Teams that have been developed. Uh, also, all the participant has been a, a, a lot of question actually. Uh, maybe I might ask just the last one, Ben, just before. Mm -hmm, sure. So, uh, Oliver, I was. Um, I was thinking if you could actually uh, tell us more about some application of the teams going towards intact proteins or even uh, complexes. Uh, do you yes, have... yes, yes. Uh, um, maybe you have heard about, I think we, we had the team from Essence uh, around Dimitris, uh, Papa Andreos uh, in, at, at the ASMS in our uh, group that, that is a former FASMATEC, or we call it now group, a FASMATEC group, and they uh, developed the uh, so-called Omnitrap. And we are, I think it's no secret, we are working on integrating the Omnitrap into the into the Timstoff, and that will give us great new fragmentation techniques, all uh, what we call EXD uh, plus UVPD and, and other things which are possible in the Omnitrap. So that will be, I think, really a great addition for, for the um, intact protein community. Um, yeah, but we are also working on improvement. We, we have uh, uh, an upgrade for the Timstoff Ultra, um, where you get uh, way improved desolvation, which we, we currently test with collaborators. So yeah, there's, there's also a lot of going on on the, on the intact uh, protein complex or uh, antibody uh, um, application side. Thanks a lot, Ben. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks very much, Oliver. And uh, thanks to all the participants. So I think we can close it there. I think the next webinar will be in March, Giuseppe Wright, and it will be the topic will be uh, reverse phase protein arrays, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so watch out for the announcement for that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Then uh, we'll end it here. And uh, thanks. Thanks again to everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Many thanks to the audience for attending that long. <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah. See you soon. And bye bye. bye.